Hey there, I'm Dominique St. Pierre, and you're listening to Go Podcast. Today I talk with Mark Carpenter, and we、uh, discuss about Game and Go and his library, Ibitin UI. Hello, Gophers. This is Dominic St. Pierre. And you know, I have a special guest today.、Uh, to be completely frank, I was going to,、uh, to do a solo episode on Ibitin very recently. And I saw a comment on Reddit. And I, I have Mark Carpenter with me today. And thank you very much for accepting this invitation, Mark. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. I'm kind of excited to talk about the library. Oh, absolutely. So, so, Mark is the author or, or, and maintainer of the you know, Ibitin UI. And、uh, I, I, will, I will start by just asking you if you can you know, present yourself a little bit, give us some background. I like to ask、uh, my guests to, you know, to have some bias a little bit towards Go, but you know, it's, it's, not, it's not necessary. I, I, think I,、uh, I think we all, we all like to,、uh, to hear a little bit about you. All right. Yeah, sure.、Um... So, hello, name's Mark.、Um, I've been a software developer for about 20 years now.、Um, and、uh, most of that's actually been in Java.、Uh, and I've never actually worked in Go professionally. So, that's probably a little different from some of your other guests. But uh, I, uh, I became pretty much an enthusiast because I wanted to learn the language. I saw it、uh, when it was originally posted. And I've always wanted to learn how to use it. So I made an, an effort to learn how to use it.、Um, so、uh, along the way, I've take, taken ownership of eBitten UI.、Um, I've built a couple tools for、um, game development in, in the language and like some simple blog software stuff, you know, the standard like learning the language kind of stuff. So, yeah. yeah. So、um, nice. So, so you, have, you have worked all your, all your career in, in Java. Is that, is that right? That's correct.、Uh, well, well, mostly. It's a long、correct. time for Java. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right.、Um, I actually started off as a C Sharp developer for like a year. I got hired on at this job、uh, to、uh, be a C Sharp developer. And then, like, the day I started, they're like, oh, no, we're a Java shop now. Learn Java. And、oh. I've been there ever since. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to,、uh, to hear,、uh, and you know, even if you only had one year at, at C Sharp, what, what, is, what is your comparison? What was your thought? Because、uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm coming from the, the other way around, and I'm also you know, near、uh, 20 years, a little bit than 20 years. So we, we, we seem to be very similar. But、uh, myself, I, I was on the Microsoft stack at the, at the beginning and always kept far from Java.、Uh, <laughs> for, for, you know, no. Really, particular good reason and things like that. It's, it's, it, you know, it just never really happened. But I'm curious to hear how, how was that transition、uh, went for you? You know,、um, thankfully, it was like a small startup shop, so there wasn't a lot of expectations. It actually went really well.、Um, the、uh, C sharp and Java, the syntax was very similar.、Uh, the main differences was learning the libraries and some of the nuances around Java. So, I mean, It was actually, I thought it was easier to go from C sharp to Java than to pick up Go from Java. Interesting. Interesting.、Uh, why, why is that? But,、uh, is, it, is it because of the object orientation, for example, in, in those languages? It is. And the syntax is similar. The general structure of the applications is very similar. Like, and you actually have similar libraries as well. Like, there's、uh, Hibernate and in Hibernate for doing.、Right. Data models and stuff like that.、Um, th frankly, it's just really similar.、Um, I do kind of miss C Sharp sometimes because I thought the、uh, UI integration with C Sharp was better, just a lot better than with Java. But、uh, I mean, that's part of the, the you know, .NET running on Windows machines. They can do that, whereas Java is supposed to be able to run on. Anything、right. and when they try to create swing, it was just kind of a giant mess, right? Okay, so when, when you say UI, UI, you mean、uh, building you know GUI a p p l i c a t i o n like desktop,、uh, Windows form, and WPF,、uh, right? All、yeah, right, exactly, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm also missing sometimes C sharp to be completely frank here.、Uh, For me, the, the part that I, I really e n j o y was when they introduced、uh, LinkQ at, at some point.、Um, 
So I, I always worked in, in you know, database heavy or data right. heavy companies and whatnot. And, um, but I, yes. I get that link. It's beautiful. Or link you. I'm not actually sure the proper way to pronounce well, it. Well, yeah, maybe it's link. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, it's fantastic. It's really well designed. And I think it, I've always thought it worked really well. Um, over the years, Java has been incorporating more and more stuff like that with its stream APIs, um, which is nice. But it it never quite felt as uh, integrated as uh, Link did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I believe yeah I believe that's also why I was uh, a little bit attracted uh, in Elixir for for line of business application as well because they, in my opinion, uh, they, their ORM is is it seems to be based a little bit on link if i if i can say that but you know i'm yeah. i i don't have a huge experience in, in elixir in production but i always uh, enjoy their uh, uh the way that you know the data is 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 flowing in in there in there um let's let's jump uh yeah we i think <laughs> uh, i think we have to talk a little bit more uh, on c sharp and and java that's fine uh, let's let's talk about uh, a bit of UI. So, how, how would you describe the library itself? So, the library is a user interface for video games. It's not built to be a generic user interface, graphical user interface, front end application. That's not the, the use case for Ebitten UI. It is built completely to be a UI layer on top of Ebit Engine or Ebitten. I think it's Ebit Engine now um, to be on top of that um, system for building games. So, because of that, it has some um, like different design choices than something like uh, Fine or Whales, which are two of the other really well-known UI systems for uh, Go. Um, I'm interesting. Yeah, I'm interested to to unpack that a lot because, to be <laughs> completely frank, when when I saw your your post uh, on on Reddit, I tried the library, and the first thing that came to mind was, "Wow, this thing seems to be the probably the easiest way to build desktop application with Go." That that was, and. I'm I'm currently do, doing a, a small uh, a small game with uh, with my younger uh, kid, uh, you know. I, it's it's a known fact that I'm a, I, I'm a blind person and wow, a blind person is is programming a game. Yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not doing any images and whatnot. So my kid is is uh, is very uh, attracted by uh, pixel art these days and things like that. So I'm I'm just I'm just programming in Go a bit. When I saw uh, you know the results. You know buttons and and uh, uh, I, I and I know that fine and wells are are the the go to thing here, but I have tried them, and to be honest, I'm I'm surprised that that you are saying that it's not the use case. Could it, could it be? So an it, an alternative or not? It could be. It. It absolutely could be. That's not the main use case for it. It's primarily designed, like I said, to be a UI for games, but it absolutely could be if that was your intention, if you wanted to build it like that. And I may be a little biased, but I actually do think even UI is easier to use than the other two. Um, like with Whales, uh, that one is essentially just a browser packaged into an EXE. So you get a, the standard stack of a Go server and like uh, some sort of HTML front end, like Vue or something like that. So you're still building a full stack application, and it's not like just a GUI app. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then Fine, um, Fine's really neat, but it does absolutely take over your your system. Like you do a Fine dot run, like to run the system. Like it, it takes over everything. Um, even UI tries not to do that. It tries to be as easy as possible. Um, again, because it's typically used as an overlay on something else. Right. And 
I, I haven't looked much at the code. So again, I have just, you know, I've just run the demo. Mm -hmm. Is it, uh, is it like using the same, same kind of, uh, construct as the, as a game, like a bit in a bit engine. Uh, I don't know how to say that. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but is it, is it like you, you, you kind of, uh, have a, a draw and an update function? Is it, is it like that for the, the, the GUI as well? It is. So it ties into the uh, update function. Basically, you call UI.update and a UI.draw inside the draw method from um, Ebitten Engine. And uh, that's where the system's doing its work to uh, draw the UI onto the screen or to update uh, and capture like mouse clicks and keyboard inputs, things like that. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that sounds pretty sexy to me compared to to fine like you said fine fine seems to to take over the, the entire well which is which is normal it, it takes like the the main thread if i if, if we can say that but yeah what what i like so far because uh returning to my small small project we we started with uh with pygame because i i thought that my kid was going to uh, to write some code at some point but uh, it turns out that uh, it's it's not like that. It's just images and and graphics and and things like that. So I I, right. I said you know it's a good time to try this uh, this Ibitin uh, thing, and I really appreciate the the simplicity of having you know two function the the draw and update with which lots of games are like that. But now you you are talking about a full a full GUI application that you you just you just create a struct and you attach two a two function like that. And you can start to compose some pretty nice. Uh, I I don't know, you know, de de maybe I, I would I would even say like decoupled uh, logic in your in your GUI, which which sounds interesting to me. Yeah, and actually, I'm doing that in my own games. So I separate out like my I can't create custom widgets based off of the existing ones that are provided by the library um, to build out my game and it's all composed inside its own struct with its own methods. And I can just call that like, it's very composable, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what, what is your game actually? And, and, you know, can you, can you tell a little bit how you, you know, you, you started uh, this, this UI kit actually, what happened there? All right. A uh, little bit of a long story, but uh, I can start from the beginning if you want. Sure. All right. Um, so I started learning Go, and uh, I did. I mentioned it earlier. I did a dumb like blog kind of app thing just to test login and all that kind of stuff, and working through um, networking with Go. And uh, as I was working through it, I'm like, okay, this project's kind of boring. And I decided, hey, why don't I make a game? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's like, hey, I love MMOs. Like that's my favorite genre of game. So let's let's try to start with that. Like. I know it was a project I didn't think would ever have a finish. And that's actually one of the biggest reasons why I chose it is because it's something I could continually work on and use to improve my skills with language and with the, the libraries. Um, so I chose that and I built the, the back end, the back end servers, because there's actually four servers that support it, um, talking to each other uh, with uh, Nats, if you've heard of that library. Yeah. Um, so I built all of that, and for the front end, I was using um, Godot, and it was nice. It actually worked really well, but the networking section of Godot is challenging if you want to have your own custom backend. Mm -hmm. um, it had the ability to do like web sockets for network communications, but if I wanted to use like something like Enet, where I could use UDP communication back and forth, and while I was able to hack it together, it was just not great. Um, and then uh, they released a newer version of uh, of Godot about a year ago, a year and a half ago, something like that. And uh, when they did, it completely broke all my tile maps and everything I had built. Like oh. it just completely destroyed my my game. And at that point, I just kind of got frustrated and said, "I'm done with Godot," and started looking for other frameworks. Um, and I really wanted to stick in with uh, with Go because uh, the back end was in Go, and I thought there would be a lot of synergy with the front end and back end both being in the same language. 
So started looking around, found e EBIT and EBIT engine and tested it out. I'm like, okay, yeah, this works great. I can do tile maps. I can do all the, uh, the physics and all the standard stuff you want to do. Um, but when I started looking at building a UI on top of it, because it's an MMO, it has chat boxes, it has settings menus, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, I couldn't find a good library for it um, that would just do the things I needed it to do. Um, and then eventually I actually stumbled on the original version of eBit and UI. So I'm not the original author of eBit and UI. However, the original version was deprecated three years ago. Um, about a year and a half before I found it, uh, the original author, um, kind of abandoned it and stopped working in go or with eBitten. And, uh, so I started playing with it. I realized, okay, this actually has a really nice framework. Like half the stuff doesn't work, but it has a really nice framework <laughs> and I like working with it. So I, I started working on my game and building my game and my UI in this, in this library. And I realized I was making a lot of really nice changes um, to make things work as you'd expect them to work and adding new widgets, et cetera. And I wanted to push that back up to the main line, but it was deprecated. So um, I really didn't want to keep a fork, but I also thought um, there's no other real good UI libraries, in my opinion, for eBitten. And... I don't want the fork to be the main one. So I reached out to the original author and uh, after a little bit of back and forth, he uh, agreed to uh, give the keys to the kingdom. Essentially he passed ownership of EBIT and UI over to me and I've been maintaining it ever since. Yeah, that's, that's a great story to be frank. I mean, this is uh this is, this is very interesting. So, but there's 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 a lot of things that I I want to unpack in here. Right? All right. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. So first of all, uh, well, first of all, yeah, the the story with Goto is pretty sad. But I'm I'm curious to to know why why you choose Go for your backend server for this MMO. What what was the reasoning there? Actually, really good reasoning is Go is very good at networking. I mean, it's built to handle a lot of network interactions like that's its primary use case and it worked very well for this and uh doing a lot of threading and things like that which align really well with building a server in the back end and frankly i just wanted to like i like working with go and yeah. <laughs> this was like a project that seemed like a lot of fun to work on in go how were you testing your server you know while you were probably not having any client to uh, to 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 play the game in, in a sense, were were you were you using a, a lot of unit testing and whatnot? You know what 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 was the development cycle was like? So, actually, I built them hand in hand, the front end and the back end, hand in hand. So, I built the original the networking um, scaffolding, basically. Um, to do the, the handshakes and create the connections and stuff. But when I was doing that, I did it on the client and the back end at the same time. Um, so that that made it actually really easy to test because I could just run the front end and did it connect? Yeah, okay, I'm good, um, <laughs> right? Uh, so once I got the, the scaffolding done for the networking, I started adding in essentially my own personal protocol um, using the message pack um, library to uh, create these packets of uh, data that I'm sending back and forth. Um, and as I was adding new features to the game, I would add new um, message types to that uh, to that protocol. And uh, it's set up so that the main server um, just essentially takes those messages and keeps the connection with that user but passes it to a backend using uh, messaging framework NATS to uh, send the messages to the appropriate backend servers. Like, um, so the front server that they connect to, you can, I can have as many of those as I want um, and just scale that horizontally as much as necessary because it's just the front door, basically. Um, I have a, a data server that connects to our data, to the database system that saves off you know, the user information periodically or, or is used to load the information on 
you know, startup, that kind of thing. But it's all um, orchestrated through that Nats uh, messaging framework I'd mentioned earlier. Interesting. Is is the server responsible for, uh, you know, all, all the the object in the map and and things like that? So the the positioning of things and and you know if if a player is moving, to replicate that to other other user is is it is it is it done directly there? Is, is it, does does the rendering is done on on the server side? Uh, no. Well, yes and no. So, like I mentioned, the the front end server the first server i call it the game server um doesn't handle that it's actually sending the messages back to the appropriate backend server that's associated with the area they're in so the world's chunked into multiple different chunks essentially and each of those chunks is responsible for the information about the, the characters and uh, creatures and stuff in that um i'm going to use the nomenclature zone they're in that specific zone um then that zone server is responsible for tracking all that information and keeping track of all that. Mm -hmm. So I run like four or five of the exact same code base. The only difference is uh, a data file that I associate with it, which has the map information for collision checking and uh, you know NPC information. Speaking of maps and NPC information, <laughs> I actually built a, a live or application in Go uh, that uh, does all that for me, allows me to, you know, drag and drop my NPCs into the right spots and set up spawning zones and like loot tables and all of that inside this highly customizable app that uh, it it's all like the entire back end is written in Go, front end's in view. I'm, I'm actually really proud of it. <laughs> nice. Yeah, sounds, uh, sounds pretty cool. I mean, uh... So, so the collision detection is, is done on the server side, you, you are saying that? Yes. Uh, I'm doing some, some collision detection on the server side. Um, it's kind of more high level. I'm not as fine-grained as I am on the client. Um, so it, it's doing like reality checks. Like you can't go this far off the map. Right. You know? right. Uh, eventually, I, depending on how things go, I might add more detailed uh, collision detection on the back end, but for right now, most of it is on the uh, most of it's on the front end. Like right now, the the major like detection I'm doing for physics on the back end is: are they actually close enough to the NPC to hit them? That kind of thing, or to talk to this in, to this merchant. That's great. So when when you say that the front end is in view, so. I thought it was it was going to be in in Ibitin because after oh, after no, you... sorry uh, that that library or that application I built to build the uh, like build the map and build the world that one is that one is in view. Oh, okay, got it, got it. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's like a it's like a world builder that that you have. Yeah, to, exactly. To create your file that you drop on on the server at the end of the day, I guess. Exactly. Oh, interesting, interesting. Okay, so so Godot, you know, it it it's crew your 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 uh, your tile and, and your images and and whatnot. So you decide at some point, well, let's try to see if there's something else, right? And 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 because of your server is written in Go, you 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 tend to to go with Ibitin. But uh, have you have you tried anything else? Uh, you know, I I know that Raylib is, is get gets a lot of. Uh, of mention these days and, and even, even in Go. So, I mean, have you, have you tried that? So I tried it a little bit when I started working on my, uh, my MMO's front end, but the reason I leaned away from it is because it's a C applic it's a C library that just has bindings in Go. Yeah. So it's, it's not built specifically for Go. And that was, I can't, that, honestly, that was a concern for me. My concern was, Hey, what if the, person maintaining these bindings either gets behind or it gets deprecated and hey there's this new feature that was just recently added but the bindings haven't been updated and uh who knows when the person's going to be able to do it so it was just i had concerns about using using that because of those reasons because it is a binding directly to a c library uh whereas ebit ebitten is built for go and runs in go and uh 
recently they've been working on something called Purego, where they're getting rid of their uh, their C bindings and doing everything directly in Go, which is super interesting. Huh. I think it's actually set up that way in Windows right now, and they're working on other systems to enable that. That's nice. Yeah, that that's also you know it matched a little bit my experience. So I'm I'm developing in. Uh, I'm also using uh, Windows for uh, my screen reader and whatnot, but I'm I'm always inside the the subsystem for Linux, the uh, WSL, and right. <laughs> I I kind of uh, I kind of I'm able to uh, to set the the Go Arch and the 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 Go Arch and the Go uh, uh, Go OS to Windows, and now I I can build the game, and it it's running natively on Windows directly. So I don't I don't need to uh, to have anything to uh, to run it. So I, I find I find that very very great. So that 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 was a, a little bit uh, a concern for me with Raylib, and and yeah, the fact that it's you know there the, there's a C there uh, a C dependencies that it's it's not as easy to build, especially cross platform like that. Uh, to be frank, so. Yeah, I, I actually haven't gotten my uh, my front end to run cross platform yet. My back end runs in Linux or Windows or whatever; it doesn't care. But uh, my uh, my front end is running in Windows, and it's I've been trying to expose it to other operating systems, but I've had problems getting the build to work properly because of the some of the CGO dependencies I have from uh, Enet. I've been using the Enet library mm-hmm. for networking. And because because it's a you know Sego connectivity thing, I'm having issues getting it to build properly, and I kind of just gave up because it wasn't a high priority to look at later. But uh, at some point, I'm probably going to get rid of Enet as well because of the same reason why I chose uh, Ebitten is because I don't like having those Sego con- like those connections. It, it causes build problems and things aren't updated at the same time because they're, you know, just bindings. They're not the actual library. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you on that. Um, all right. So at, at some point you, you have your, your game rewritten. Were you f- very far away with your good old version? Uh, how much time it, it took you to, to rewrite that to, uh, to a bit in? So, it took me a little longer than I anticipated. I mean, in the end, it took me about six months. But okay. part, of, part of that was because I had to rewrite a significant portion of EBIT and UI to uh, support some of the features I needed. Things like uh, there's a window widget, which is what it sounds like. It's a widget that can you can drag and drop across the screen and have other widgets inside it. So like a pop-up window, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, when I like originally took over the library and started working on it, you couldn't have other like input widgets with within it. Like it just didn't work. Um, and you also couldn't drag and drop it either or resize it. It's like none of that was implemented. Like it, it had like the base framework of the idea of what a window was, but none of the actual implementation. And that was kind of what happened with a lot of the the widgets within the library. So I ended up having to do a lot of that cleanup before I could um, implement it in my game. So I would implement what I could in the the game's client and then when I got to a point where there's some UI elements I needed to add, I would go switch over to Ebit and UI to work on that to get that enabled. And then, you know, deploy that, do a release and go over back to my game and pick that in and start utilizing it. So it took a little time to uh, get Ebin UI to a place where I think it's in a really functional state. Um, obviously, there's you know more work to be done, but uh, I think it's in a very nice state at this point, and I've had no problems integrating and finishing catching up to where my client originally was. Yeah. W- were you having the, uh, the total ownership of the project at this moment? Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay, I, that, I guess. That I, yeah, yeah, totally. Um, nice so, thing, though, um, yeah. while I was doing this, I actually did get people uh, giving uh, pull requests along the way. So people have been using it, and like they like it enough. They're like, "Hey, 
let's add this to it. And it's like, all right, perfect. So I've actually had some pretty good interaction with the, uh, with the users of the library uh, on my Discord. They've been giving really good feedback and helping out with PRs here and there. So was the Discord that came with, uh, with the ownership of the repo as well, or you started that from scratch? I started that one from scratch. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's good. I mean, so uh, the yeah. only thing, what came with uh, the library when I took ownership was the main repo and then a repo for the docs. So there was a, a basic docs page that uh, was put together. Uh, I believe it only had one page at that point, maybe two, um, but has since been enhanced quite a bit. Um, but that was it. It was just those two repos and then nothing else. So since then, I've just kind of been trying to build it out um, and sharing it with the world and sharing it with those in uh, the eBitten Discord as well. So they, they know it exists and they can use it if they want. Well, yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, this is this is great because, uh, I mean, all games needs need some UI at some point. <laughs> yeah, most of them do. I mean, I have definitely seen some people just implement the very basics on their own, like basic buttons and stuff. I, I actually kind of feel bad for them because it's like that. It's almost a waste of time, man. You could get that very, very cheaply if you just use this library. <laughs> oh, totally. But, yeah. But I get it. A lot of people come to a a tool like eBitten because they want to build a lot of it themselves. I yeah, mean, that's part of the reason I came to the language and the the library. Yeah, it's a good learning curve to be to be frank to start from scratch. Uh, you know, compared to having to learn a framework or a, or any kind of of tool. Uh, I mean, it's it's nice to understand what's going on. I think I think uh, I think eBitten is is that that type of. Uh, we can yeah. compare that to any kind of frameworks on, on the website. It's 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 nice on on Go that you know you still you still can go very uh, I would say uh, very deep and, and understanding you know a little bit of the HTTP stack and whatnot. There. Definitely, and I will say I really I really appreciate what they've done with Ebit, and it's just so simple to use, and it makes so much sense when. Uh, when you look through its documents, like building this UI library is very easy because of the work that uh, they've done on their library. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I also think that I, I've I see it. I, I've seen it. Uh, it. It was a long time ago. It, it was sold like. It was talking about the NS system, like a eight bit game, like the NS and things like that. Right. So yeah, I I, I seen it and I was like, oh yeah, I I don't know, <laughs> but but it's it's way more than that. I mean, it's uh, it, yeah, for for two D games, I mean, it it just works. It really is. I mean, any kind of two D game works really well with it. I've seen like some isometric stuff. I've seen just straight two D. And I've seen a couple other things. Someone's built like a rudimentary 3D engine, kind of like a Doom kind of engine in it, which oh. is kind of neat. And <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, I recently saw someone's building a like a 3D mech game in the language as well. If you look in their show and tell forum, it's on there. It looks really cool. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's impressive to be frank, and it's it's very simple. So if, I mean, if if you're listening to that and you 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 don't really know it, and you 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 like to, uh, I don't know, to write some small games and whatnot, it's it's a great way to start. I, I would admit, uh, you know, Pi Pi game is is nice as well. I mean, uh, don't don't get me wrong, but you 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 still you still have a lot to uh, to read and things like that. But Ibitan is just simple. Yes. And I try to make eBitten UI simple too. <laughs> um, I've done a lot of things recently. Uh, so people come into the library and that a lot of them are newer developers and don't really know how to read code from other libraries and stuff like that, don't really want to. So I've done a lot of things to try to make the usage of the library simpler. So there are demo widgets for, or demos for every single widget. And you can actually uh, connect to them on the web and see every single 
widget we have as a um, WASM embedded into your web page application uh, for every single widget, which is kind of nice. And then you can look at the source code for each of the widgets with comments to explain what the different uh, functionality does. So that actually took a lot of time to get that working and to get that uh, put together. But uh, I'm really happy <laughs> that that's out there now. Yeah, it's it's really helpful to uh, to see a demo like that for sure because you uh, you know you you can just see what 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 you can do with it. To be frank, uh, the 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 was wasm uh, exporting of of Ibitin is really nice. I mean, I have you have you have any issues to to output your the library? Was there any any kind of, of you know tricks that you needed to change or any 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 problem that you had? Actually, yeah, there, there was a really big pain to get this working on uh, WASM for input dialog. So anything where you type into the screen, um, it didn't really work on mobile. So it worked fine on desktop as it was, but if you pulled it up on a mobile um, browser, it wouldn't work because the 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 keyboard wouldn't pop open. So I actually spent... Uh, a week, week and a half working on it to get the get the uh, the, wow. the silly keyboard to pop yeah. open when you click inside the uh, the text box, and that was that was challenging. I had to uh, do some of the JavaScript interop stuff with uh, with the with Go to get it to actually call the right methods to pop it open, and oh, then wow. like. And then do the uh, interaction to say when they t hit this button, copy it from like this hidden um, input widget into the actual widget on the screen and and back and forth and dealing with uh, the fact that you can move the carrot in different places and making sure that the carrot position was aligned properly so that if you hit backspace, it would actually backspace the right character. Right. That that's, does not sound fun at all. <laughs> that that was a challenge. I think that's actually the biggest challenge I've dealt with with this library was getting that to work. <laughs> nice. And other than that, I mean, it, it it looks exactly the same on, I guess, uh, Linux, Windows, and Mac, probably. It does. Yeah. So it's kind of neat how it works. Um, if you if you're good for me to go into that a little bit. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh. Cool. Yeah. So basically, what it does is it has an update loop where it's going through and capturing your um, mouse clicks, keyboards, interactions, and then it's reacting to that on the draw loop. So in the draw loop, all it's doing is just drawing pictures to the screen, which is how Ebitten is put together. So it is kind of a layered approach. You have this image and it's using all that information and the setup that you did to... Uh, position your widgets where you want them on the screen and it's just straight up drawing them onto the screen so the draw is actually really simple it's take this image draw it for these dimensions and move on to the next one and it's kind of nice i really like working with it oh yeah absolutely so it's it's the same for all the widget inside inside of there so let let's uh is there any drop down so for instance when uh is, is the library I guess is 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 uh you know handling when when there's a mouse click and now you are you are drawing the uh, the option uh, b b beside the drop down or below I guess yeah it it handles combo boxes it handles right click context menus as well um, huh. and drag and drop all those kind of functionality um, it's all baked it's all generally built off of that, uh, that window object I mentioned at the very beginning. So it all utilizes that, that window to handle all that behind the scenes. So with EBIT, with EBIT engine, everything is uh, positioned based off of a container and a layout for that container. So you do, you nest containers to put widgets in the proper places and that's just generally how it works. Windows, on the other hand, are outside of that process, outside of that container process. So when you add a window to the system, it gets drawn on top of everything else at the very end. So 
you, you draw your UI, then you create a window and it will draw that at the end to uh, uh, put it on top of everything else. So because of how that window works, uh, like when you right click on something, it's actually just popping open a new window with the um, elements that you've like requested to be in that uh, window. So in the back end, it's all just a window, but on the front end, it just looks like a combo box or a, hmm. or a tool tip or a, a context menu. Interesting. So if, if someone wants to create their own widget, do, do, do they have to, to start from this window uh, structure? or So they don't have to start with a window. They could start with pretty much anything. Um, there are a few interfaces that are needed to be implemented, but if you inter implement those interfaces, then you can add them to a container. And once it's added to a container, at that point, it'll start being drawn. To the system so as long as you implement the interfaces you're good uh, window i like using window all the stuff i utilize in my mmo is based off windows but it doesn't have to be um, a good example someone wanted a uh, a labeled checkbox so okay. originally the ui like a bitten ui didn't have a label checkbox it just wasn't a widget you just had the checkbox and you had a label um, someone really, really wanted that capability to have like the label, like if you click on the label, it'll check the checkbox to have that, that tie in. So they created a new widget called the label checkbox where it's the, the two widgets composed together and, uh, some, uh, code to tie them in together for like the click events and stuff. So that one, they didn't start with a window. They just started with, I think they started with the checkbox and added label information to it and added the drawing of the label. So, so that means that the, the, the click events event is, is accessible to, 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 to this checkbox itself. So it's, it's not only trapped by, you know, a bit and UI, but it's also available for the user to do whatever they want to do with that. Absolutely. So um, we have, there's a uh, base object called a widget, which has all of the mouse events. So mouse in, mouse out, mouse, mouse pressed, mouse released. Nice. Um, and you can tie in, add as many events, event handlers to those as you want. Um, and it's built so that uh, you can, as you're defining the object, you can specify those handlers as you're defining them. Okay, so is 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 the is that what you were saying with with the with the loop? I guess you are checking for those property in, in inside this loop, so you can react. Uh, you know what? Okay, this widget is is pressed, for example, or yes, yeah, that's exactly it. Okay, oh, that's that's great. So so this widget uh, structure is probably something that is a good good blank uh, blank canvas to to start a. A completely custom widget, for example. Uh, sort of. Um, every every widget, like every new widget, has a widget. So that's how it's built. So you, it has a widget. So it's not extending it. Like uh, you don't just you know put it into the struct. You like have a widget object within the struct. Right, right, right. But yes, um, that is the ideal way to start a new one. There is some documentation on that in the, uh, on the webpage. It's not the greatest though. Um, honestly, if someone wanted to create a new widget, my strongest suggestion would be to take a look at either label checkbox or, um, just a button and yeah. take, start with that and go from there to add what you wanted. So when I was uh, playing with the library, like learning the library in the first place. That's actually how I learned it is because there were two widgets I wanted to see if I could implement. And once I was able to implement those two, I was able, like I it convinced me I wanted to continue with the library. Um, so like a progress bar that seemed to be pretty simple to me, you know, <laughs> just two images, one fills up the other. Right. Yeah. Um, and 
it didn't have it. So I'm like, all right, I'll build this. I'll build a progress bar. And uh, that's pretty much what I did. I started with button and ripped out all the buttony stuff and added in the what I needed for a progress bar. I just used uh, that as a starting point. Nice. So I, I suppose I suppose there there's some probably public function to set the, uh, the the percentage of the progress bar for for example if if you are coming from an external uh, I don't know if you, if you are creating this game and and this progress bar is I don't know the the else of of, uh, of a character for example you need to set the the value from from the game loop yes um, so it. It's not actually setting the percentage, it's setting the value. So you set a max value and the current value. Okay. Yeah. That's... And then it'll calculate the percentage to draw based off of that. Nice. Um, there are some other uh, things along with that. Like you, there's a change event. So when that changes, you can capture that event and do something with it. Um, and I've used that in the past to add like a, a label on top to show the percentage as a number. Um, that's not built into the uh, progress bar because not everyone needs it. And it's easily added, you know, you can easily add it yourself if you need it. So that was one of those design decisions I made along the way. Like, I don't want to make these widgets terribly heavy because then it just kind of makes it more difficult to use in the long run. Like, you don't need to have a like it doesn't need to have a label it doesn't really add anything when you can just easily add one yourself if you need it right and how how is that uh usable from the uh, from the caller point of view so are, are we passing a, an inline function for example to this uh this is event or how does the how does the widget call an external function so you can either pass in uh, an anonymous function to the uh, the widget as you're creating it, or you can create a a function in one of the packages or off of a struct and pass that in. As long as it matches the uh, signature, it will accept it. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that that's uh, that seems to yeah. That, that, returning to our our first, you know. Uh, Attempt at discussing GUI uh, application with Fine. Th this this to me feels very good as a desktop GUI <laughs> way of of building things. So I'm, I'm I know that you are you have said that it's it's probably not meant to to be that, but I don't know. To me, uh, it seems to be it seems to be an interesting aspect that maybe it was not meant for that originally, but it could certainly play that role and. Because the, you know, the concept and the the pattern in in how it's built, it's so simple. It, it's it's just it's respecting the Go philosophy of just, you know, it just works and it it's just simple. There's no, there's not much, you know, mental uh, mental model that I need to build to understand what's going on there. It's just you know, it's just very very straightforward in my opinion. I like to think so. Um, there are definitely a few challenges I've definitely faced along the way that I know some of the users are facing. And there's two of them. I'm still trying to figure out the best way to solve them. But uh, uh, working on it. like One of the reasons why I say it's mostly for games is because of these two issues. Um, so the first one is it doesn't have a default UI, basically. So yeah. it's almost a headless UI system. It, it expects you to provide the images for like, what does, what does a window look like? Um, so it, at this point, it expects the user to provide those images on, on what to draw. So that's a bit challenging for newer developers who are not used to this system. And uh, it can be a bit of a, a roadblock. Like we, there is a demo application that does have a lot of these UI elements that uh, people can use, but it's definitely not going to fit the style of most people's games. It's kind of like a sci-fi kind of uh, UI look. I'm, and uh, that's some one of the challenges that I'm trying to deal with now. I've actually started working on like a theming system 
and the idea is that uh, instead of having to pr like provide these images on like every button you create, you just say, this is what a button looks like. These are the images to use for every button in the game. And uh, it just kind of goes from there. Uh, and long term, once that functionality is added, hopefully, um, the idea is I'll put out a, uh, a new repo of just U eBit and UI themes that people can add new themes to. Um, and like add a light theme, add a dark theme to the system so that people can just pull in and start utilizing. So hopefully that would help uh, make the system a little bit easier for people to use and make me feel a lot more comfortable saying it'd be <laughs> good for a like a desktop application. Yeah, yeah, this, sound, uh, this sounds awesome, to be frank. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it's... Uh, yeah. It's not terrible to provide. I, I think you were saying like nine images. It's. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you are building your own kind of GUI style. So it's it's it's, it's normal that you you need to to provide some. Uh, I don't know some design. Right. Uh, well, I think something like you know, fine. They have this the standard like system UI kind of look, where this library doesn't provide that right now. I mean, we could, um, but right now that's just not something that's provided because that's not really the focus of the UI, of this system. Um, but hopefully once this whole theming th thing is put together, that, <laughs> that is something we could provide in the future. Yeah, sure. Um, the, the other thing is there's certain widgets that people tend to expect on front-end applications that are not super necessary for games. Things like... Uh, you know, grids. Uh, a lot of desktop applications shockingly have a lot of grids. And that's just not something that's supported right now. There, there's a few other like widgets and container types that we don't support yet, which is, you know, like that one, which is why I'm not comfortable saying it's for right. desktops. And it's not really a competitor with like Fine or Whales at this point. Oh, sure. And I, I guess also, you know, the the tree icon and the file uh, file open save browser um, dialogues yeah. yeah yeah those are the type of things you don't really see in games and it's not super necessary and right. like the window widget while very useful for games is not terribly useful for a desktop ui um, that kind yeah. of style uh, application's gone out of favor a long time ago sure Sure, but I mean it's yeah. I under I I hear you, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I I don't know. I, yes, I I will I will I will of course integrate integrate it into uh, into the small game that I'm building. But uh, I I just I just I don't know. It it feels good. Uh, so far, it, it it seems to be uh, to be nice. I mean, it definitely is, and you absolutely can build a front end GUI in it, like not related to games. It's absolutely something that can be done. It's just going to take a little uh, extra work of the type most people doing that wouldn't be used to. So like providing what your UI is supposed to look like, that kind of thing. But if someone wanted to, wanted to do that and wanted to build a front-end application using this library, absolutely. There's, I see no reason why they couldn't at this point. Yeah, sure. And you and you get you get all the all the sounds from uh, Bitten as well. I mean, th there's something to do there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, so, any any challenge that that you're facing uh, challenges probably with uh, maintaining an open source project? Uh, you know, are you looking for a contributor? Is it is it is it hard for you to uh, to get some kind of traction? Uh, how, how is it going? So. I'm actually getting a lot of traction of people utilizing it. Like I know some people have released some games utilizing this library, which makes me super happy. Um, but the biggest challenges I'm dealing with is essentially time. Um, I have my own game I'd like to work on. I have that tool I mentioned before, and I'm supporting this library. And there's just a lot to do. Yeah. And I, <laughs> it's a lot for one person. Um, so the biggest challenge I have is finding the time to do all the things with EBIT and UI that I want to do. Um, and you asked about contributors. Oh yes. I would absolutely love contributors. I contributors are my best friends. <laughs> sure. Well, I, I, I think that 
EBIT engine will probably gain some traction, uh, especially if you if they continue to what you, what you were saying earlier. If they if they remove the the, the CGO, uh dependencies, um, I mean this this is our library to build game in Go. The the native one, the one that is pure Go, it's uh, it's something I, I'm I'm seeing a lot of of traction with Go uh, lately. I would say in the last, I would you know eight eight to ten months, there's something going on. Yeah, I've noticed that too. There's there's a been a influx of people like my my own personal Discord's grown quite a bit in the past six months as well. You know, I think it's almost doubled in size. I mean, it's not huge, but still, <laughs> doubling size is kind of nice. Yeah. So, uh, so yes, I, I think that if 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 they are getting traction, then uh, you know, by ricochet, you you will you will receive a lot a lot a lot of of those uh, of those people that that want to build game, and they will they will need some some UI, and and this library seems to be uh, very uh, very easy to use. I hope so. <laughs> on both counts. Um, right. All I know is I'm going to keep working on the library. I, I'm working on it for my own game, so there's no point for me to ever stop working on this library. So it's going to continue to get updates. Um, not as fast as I'd like, but because, you know, there's only so much time in the day, but uh, it will always be maintained. <laughs> yeah, that that's pretty nice. I mean, this is uh, this is probably the... The easiest uh, way to to maintain a project if you're using it yourself. What what about your game? I mean, uh, is it is it available? Can can people uh, if, if 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 some curious people want to to see what uh, what it is, can can they see it? So yes, they can, but it's only a link on my Discord at this point. It's a link to a private itch.io download. Um, mm-hmm. I've I've left it like that because at this point it's mostly a tech demo, so. I mean, you can log in, you can create your character, pick your character's faces. It has like an auto patcher, which was also a lot of fun to build and go, by the way. Um, and uh, it does all of the standard like MMO things, but it doesn't like have a- AI for the NPCs yet. Right. Um, so, and, or it doesn't like, it doesn't have leveling up yet. But it, it does have like the animations. You can run around. You can see your friends run around. You can talk to them. You can send private messages to them, that kind of stuff. So I really haven't um, pushed it out there because I just don't feel like it's in a place where most people would have fun playing it. If you wanted to check it out, absolutely. Um, I keep the server running all, all the time uh, just because I think it's neat that it's out there. Um, but uh, yeah, if anyone did want to check it out, uh, there is a link at the top of the Discord for the game. Sure, we, we will have the your Discord link in the show note for sure. What what is a uh, auto patcher? I'm sorry, I, I don't know that. Oh, uh, so it's an it's an application that runs on your system. So you, when you start the game, you actually start the auto patcher, and what it's doing is it's checking to see if there's a new version oh, of the of the yeah, game yeah. or assets. Yeah, if yeah. there are, it will prompt you to download them. It'll you know hit the download button and it will download all the individual pieces, upload the game and then restart the game using those new assets. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little, little bit curious now about, about this. If you, if you <laughs> allow me a couple of questions. Of so when, when, when a, a user start the game, so actually are they, are they starting the, the auto patcher process or they are starting the game and the game start the auto start, uh, the auto patcher. How, how does it work? So, when they download the game, they're actually downloading the auto patcher. And then you hit the auto patcher runs. It says, Hey, I don't have all the game assets. You hit the download button. It will actually download the game and all the assets, like the rest of it. Um, so the initial download is actually really small, but, uh, everything else, you know, takes a little bit of time and then it will only update the pieces that have changed since the last time you ran it. Right. Okay, but let's say we are six months later. What when I when I launch the game? What am I launching? Am I launching the the auto patcher or the game itself? The patcher. Okay, it's always the patcher. So the patcher, yeah. the auto patcher is, is responsible to start the game as well. Yeah. So the auto patcher right now is handling the making sure the game assets are up to date, 
Um, and it's also handling the general login. So doing the log, the username, password kind of stuff and <laughs> confirming that you have a proper token and then passing that on to the actual game process. Is it two separate uh, Go binaries? It is. And I guess that you build the Autopatcher uh, with, with Ebiton UI as well. I do. That's cool. That's 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 cool. <laughs> yeah. So um, actually that auto patcher was my main motivation, my first motivation to build a uh, text box widget because that didn't come with a library either, like the ability to have like a paragraph like with a scroll bar and stuff. Okay, so, so yeah, you're you're showing the uh, the latest game update and whatnot in there? Exactly. Right. That, that that sounds fun. I mean, I, for for uh, how long have you have you been working on your game? So, I've spent about I'll be honest about nine months total um, working on it, and I haven't had a chance to work on it in like six months, yeah. which is annoying. <laughs> yeah. Um, just because you know, life and working on other libraries and tools sure. and stuff, but. Uh, I'd say a total of about nine months between all the things. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that sounds uh, pretty pretty much. Uh, it's a huge investment. I I see that. I, you know, it's it's not like I'm building a, a game, a, a huge game or what. But just I always wanted to do that, and uh, yeah, it's fun. I mean, if you if you if you haven't done that, uh, listener here, I mean, I let's try it. It's it's very fun to build a game. It really is. And honestly, I chose one of the dumbest games for a solo developer to ever make. Like <laughs> when when I chose this, I absolutely knew the chances of me actually completing it were almost nothing. Right. But I don't care. That that's the entire reason I picked it in the first place is because I want a a task that I can continually work on and improve and make better and like util like it's a fun hobby for me, essentially. Yeah. So it's another one of those, it will always keep getting updates. It may be slow, but it will keep getting updates because it's fun. It's fun oh. for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. All right, Mark, is there, is there anything that I missed? Uh, do you want to, uh, you know, anything that you would like to add before we wrap up? Um, just anyone who uh, utilizes the library, feel free to join my Discord. I'm always happy to help anyone that has any questions. Um, and if there's something you need that's not there, I'm always willing to uh, look into adding it, that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, and I, will, I, will, pro- I, will, I will take this occasion to remind everyone that, you know, when you are using a library and you like it, it's very nice just to, uh, you know, you can open an issues, you can talk with the maintainer as a maintainer myself, you know, there, there's, no small con- there, there's no small contributions. Just you know, just reach out and and see if you can help in in any way. And this is uh this is very appreciated. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh, uh, one more thing, if you don't mind. Uh, mm-hmm. there's a really cool repo in uh, GitHub called Awesome Ebit Engine, and it has a list of like all of the game related libraries you could possibly want for working with Ebit. It, it's amazing. Um. I'll I'll send you the link and hopefully you can add it to this because I think everyone would like to see it. <laughs> oh yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm like, I'm like super curious all of a sudden uh, myself as well. <laughs> so yeah, send <laughs> send me the link. We will have that on the show notes. Yeah. So all right, Mark. Thank thank you very much. That was that was really nice. Maybe maybe you you can return in a, in a couple of months and then see and see how things are going. I I, I find it very interesting to talk about uh, about game development and go. I mean this is a. Uh, this is not a topic I think that uh, that we are used to uh, to associate with Go, and we uh, you know we have we have very great libraries. Oh yeah, definitely, and there there's more added all the time. So yeah, totally. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, hopefully we can we can talk uh, later. Yeah, definitely. It was good talking to you. All right. All right, that's it for this week. I would really appreciate if you can talk or share about this podcast. It's always helpful. 
Also, another way to support the show is by purchasing my course. There's always a link in the show notes. So on that, see you next week.